Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to week two. Uh, for those of you who I haven't had a chance to um, introduce myself to, I'm Jessica Lesson, the founder of The Information, and um, we've been helping organize this program. So um, thank you to everyone who participated in week one, who um, has been participating in the Facebook group. Um, let it, I don't wanna take up much time to just talk about how we can continue to to oh ready for the lesson you guys are already firing on the comments okay we're ready um but um really excited to have made a bunch of connections already and hope you guys are finding it valuable um i'm going to turn it over to the great isaac lee um we are so lucky to have isaac you know um just such a breath of experience in television and digital video and the evolution of that and the modernization of that and the techification of that and many other things as it relates to storytelling. So um, previously, Isaac was the chief content officer of Univision um, and is now um, has started his own firm, which I hope we'll talk about as well, but very excited um, to have a wide ranging conversation about the role um, that video can play in the future of our craft. And um, I think you will find it a very um, interesting conversation. So, um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Isaac. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, it's, it's great to be here. I am a huge fan of the information and of all the fabulous journalism that you guys do. And that's why I'm here. Um, and I will be, uh, sharing with, with all of you, uh, some, some brief, uh, introduction and then going through a couple of slides. But mostly what I really want to do is talk to you, answer your questions, and be able to have a conversation that I hope is uh, somehow useful. So the, the, the question that, that the information asked me to tackle is, what is the future of television and uh, video journalism? And, and it's, it's a difficult question to answer. It haunts me much more than it excites me. Um, but but there is some excitement in that challenge. I, I, I love television journalism. I started as a young investigative journalist in Colombia. And um, 60 Minutes was, you know, the gods of television. And, and I, I always aspired to do something as good as that. And I, I was incredibly lucky. Um, Mike Wallace gave me my letter of recommendation uh, to get a visa to, to come to the US. And when I, when I came here, I was able to uh, meet heroes like Bob Simon, uh, like Lowell Bergman, and, and even work with Lowell on a couple of incredibly interesting projects and investigative TV series. And for, for you guys who don't know who Lowell is, he, he is the one that Al Pacino plays in The Insider, um, which is a great movie to watch. And, and at that moment, to have a TV producer as the hero of a film was, uh, was a normal thing. Today is much harder. I, I, I don't see that happening uh, so much, but I'm, I, I feel incredibly fortunate to have been able to uh, leave those experiences and work with people like that. Um, I, I think that it's very interesting that our industry is being completely disrupted by three different things. Uh, the first one is technology. Um, uh, it is changing at a pace um, that we have never seen before. The second one is optionality. H how much um, are we going to dedicate time to each window a day? And within those windows, how many alternatives we have? It is, it is a vast um, ocean of choices. And the third one, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, and I can add a little bit of value there, it's demographics, which, which I think it's, it's incredibly relevant to this conversation. And so the old structures that, that sustained TV journalism are basically 
completely changed. Um, I, I ran a, a network news division for many years. Um, they do an outstanding job, even a better one since I left. Uh, uh, the, the team there is as good as it gets. Um, but I am not sure that uh, it's easy to say that the future of journalism is in TV network um, or in broadcast television. Even if you look at cable, um, there's a lot of hype on what's going on with CNN and what's going on with Fox News and MSNBC. If you look at CNN, they, they post a billion dollars of profits. Um, not not just revenues. I mean, they they do incredibly well. So how can journalism be in a crisis when Fox News and when CNN are doing so well? Um, it's it's in my opinion vastly because they have scaled back on enterprise and original reporting and have turned into something that it's much cheaper and easier to do, which is talk which is having talking heads. And that adds very little value um, and requires much less reporting, um, in-depth uh, investigation, editing, vetting, and so on and so forth. And that's why you basically listen to the same talking points coming from one side or the other um, and they don't change much depending on on uh, which uh, uh, show or network you are listening to, knowing that some are on the extreme right, some are on the left, some are trying to be in the middle. But but um, it's it's really not uh, a lot of preparation, a lot of investigation, a lot of storytelling involved in those shows. Um, and and. They do journalism, um, uh, but to me, enterprise stories, the one that requires an investigative team, the ones that are hard to do, that you need to work for months, um, are the ones that are most valuable. And, and that is something that I am seeing more and more in subscription uh, written journalism and in docu-series and documentaries and less and less into TV and broadcast journalism. Um, when, when there was this huge you, you know, change and optimism on the internet, we, we all thought that the democratization of video journalism was going to be very positive. And, and just to imagine that you could source video from anywhere in the world and to have your story travel to anyone, with no boundaries, um, seem, seemed incredibly cool. I, I am less optimist about that because I think that the gatekeepers um, have changed. We, we used to have gatekeepers in Wall Street. They were the ones that were deciding on where the advertising dollars were going. They were deciding on where the stock market was going of the companies that were owning media. And, and now we have shifted to gatekeepers in Silicon Valley. Um, and, and that is uh, something that, that maybe we don't see that clearly, uh, but that definitely has a huge impact into the work that we do as journalists. Um, Silicon Valley has a way of uh, keeping most of the revenues that are generated by journalists with their work. Um, and there are some great new experiments and new platforms coming up like Snapchat or TikTok. And, and they allow creative people to have different approach in different formats in different times. And that feels new and fresh, but, but it, it doesn't replace um, what I consider that journalism needs to add to the conversation. Um, in any event, I, I, I don't want to leave you with hopeless thoughts before I uh, share some graphs with you. So 
I, I see a lot of possibilities um, of, of doing really good journalism in the streamers, which is what we call today in the jargon, the OTT players. Um, they have a lot of money. They are competing with each other in a way that is unbelievable. Library is not enough to keep the novelty, the subscriptions to mitigate churn. So original programming is more and more important every day. Um, and, and you see great documentary series like Dirty Money. You see great um, explanatory journalism like what Vox does. Um, and there's, there's every time and more and more different um, opening to journalism and to long form storytelling in Netflix, Amazon, HBO, Hulu, Apple. And, and I think that's going to increase. Um, I also think that there's an interesting trend um, in, in bypassing completely the gatekeepers and going direct to the consumer. I, I am not an expert and I don't follow the evolution of that uh, very closely because it's not my business, but Substack and Patreon and these, these different alternatives for people that have a brand and a different way of storytelling, I think it's something that it's also interesting to consider. That, that is different because that is not something that they teach you at journalism school how to create your own identity and your own voice and your own brand and do things in a unique way. It's something that you have to figure out yourself. Um, and, and, you know, thinking about what, what advice I have for you, uh, <laughs> which uh, uh, nothing is going to surprise you, but, but sometimes common sense is not as common as it seems. So, um, I, I would like to tell you that, you know, do your best to tell the stories in a clear and understandable way for the audience. Uh, break news. Don't, don't, don't think that narrative analysis, post commentary is more important than breaking news. Um, uh, breaking news changes the conversation. Avoid gossip, avoid anonymous sources um, that you cannot uh, corroborate, avoid information that it's not substantiated. Um, if something is conventional wisdom, it, it, it is maybe bullshit. So uh, uh, think twice before adhering to those theories. Um, master your craft be extremely good at something. Uh, know that in the different ways of storytelling and journalism today, if it's with data, if it's with video, if it's with audio, if you're doing a podcast, writing a column, just master a skill and be very good at it. Um, have a sense of style and aesthetics. I, I think that uh, we, even if, uh, if it's in audio, how you produce a, a podcast, how you design an experience, how do you um, create the visuals, the animations, it's going to matter a lot. You are competing for people's time. Um, another advice I have is learn history. Um, absorb it. Many of the things that you would think that are unprecedented uh, have deep roots and are not happening just because. Um, so be interested in the world. Be interested in having context. Grapple with it. Um, and and maybe the 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 last uh, advice and something that I learned a lot at Univision is be devoted to the audience, serve them. Understand that when you are a journalist, you um, are not just running a business. There is public trust 
in the mission and you have to be accountable for it. Never disdain them. You know, if, if your editors or producers or think, think that the audience is shallow or uninformed, they're wrong. They are not. Um, they can see what they are being pandered to and they genuinely have the wish to understand the world around them. Um, and, and those are like the, like the key things that come to mind. I am going to ask all the questions that you want. Before that, I prepared a couple of slides that I want to share with you um, that are, are pretty simple. The first one is, is about the future of television and, and how much it's declining um, in broadcast TV. You know, more than 16 million American homes have cut the cord since 2013. Another 10 million are going to cut the cord in the next two years. And, um, and, and, and there's a vast number of people that are not going to uh, go through pay TV. Why? Because there was a bundle that was charging too much money um, to people um, and you, you, you didn't have the opportunity to have a menu and select and have your own choices. And, and now the consumer is in control of the experience. Uh, streaming video is becoming stronger and stronger. The penetration rate is huge. And, and you will see that now that we are living through this pandemic that we don't understand well yet, and we do not know what the behavioral changes are going to be and how they, were, they will impact, um, uh, one of the winners are definitely going to be streaming platforms, gaming platforms um, that are going to retain a lot of the, of the customers. Um, we, we, I was raised in a generation where appointment television was incredibly important. To me, that is over. Uh, Game of Thrones was the last time that we had really appointment television that people didn't want to miss and were going to talk about it for the next you know, week. And, and you would be out of the water cooler conversation if you didn't see it. Um, but even the best of the, of the different um, sports events and docu-series and fantastic storytelling, um, they, they tend to go down and down because the commitment to a schedule is much less important when you can stream and binge watch. Um, I, I think that sports and news um, reality shows and some temple events still have a place in broadcast television. Um, I, I, I've been following what has happened with the women's soccer team, and I am, I am very inspired because the, the men's soccer team isn't that good here in the U.S. I, I, I love that the women's um, soccer team is the best in the world, and, and the ratings that they have had are, are huge. Um, and, and if you look at what has happened during the pandemic, all of the different 24-hour news networks have increased the ratings in a dramatic way. Um, ten polls still matter. You look at the Latin Grammys with an audience that it's not supposed to be um, uh, general market, and still you get 8 million viewers at Univision watching the awards and what happens with the Latin Grammys. If you look at events created to come up with solutions when we cannot have graduations for all of the people that deserve it, like graduate together, they are reaching 20 million people. And, and um, the, the newest version of a Live 8 concert, of a We Are the World concert, um, which is what Global Citizen did, it, it reached 20 million people as well. So, so there is still the idea that to share an event and watch it with your friends and 
uh, have commentary is is very important. Uh, mobile is is what's going to grow most. It's what offsets the decline of um, of uh, TV, and and uh, the the amount of people that are still very interested in news on a daily basis or uh, several times a day is is still relevant enough for us to work very hard and win them over and turn those casual users into more frequent users. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's interesting when I was talking about the gatekeepers um, that are controlling what we watch and taking the biggest share of revenues. Um, when you look at the power of Facebook, for example, that now controls WhatsApp and Messenger and Instagram, um, it's, it's huge, but it's also, you know, Google with YouTube. And it, it's, it's all of those different platforms that are uh, creating and incentivizing through their algorithms and their uh, sales teams. W what is it that you should be watching? Um, I, I think it's interesting to see what is shifting in terms of content preferences. Um, um, mockumentaries and sports documentaries in this pandemic are on the rise. Um, and um, more uh, vain things like family reality and you know talk shows and things like that are decreasing, um, which I think it's interesting. Going to, to the demographic side of it, I, I, I want you to please pay attention to this because I, I don't think that we understand enough what is it that is changing so much. We, we live in a country that used to be 80% Anglo. Uh, when I was born in 1971, you know, it was about 65% Anglo. And, and every time uh, the amount of immigrants, the amount of mixed race, the amount of um, people that are uh, of different color, that are more diverse, um, is, is changing completely the country. And it's also changing completely how we consume news and what's interesting to us. I, I, I come from a world where, where we, we always remember that one out of three babies that are being born in the U.S. are Latinos. Um, there are complexities to that. They will speak English, not Spanish. They will prefer to see news in English and so on and so forth. But culture matters um, and diversity matters. Um, and there are a couple of, of uh, uh, experiences that I have had um, in, in new ways of storytelling, uh, new ways of uh, doing journalism. Um, in non-scripted, I can point to a couple of great examples. Science Fair is one of my favorites. Um, uh, all the credit goes to Cristina Constantini, who is a Latina from Wisconsin, really well prepared, came to the newsroom when she was in her early 20s and told us she wanted to tell a story about science fairs because she, she was a science fair um, uh, fan and it had a huge impact in her life. And she thought that the ability for diverse kids to, to tell their story and to um, uh, create enthusiasm for women and diverse kids and, and, and be interested in STEM was key. And uh, I, I never expected it to be such a huge success um, because it's positive, um, it, it gives you a lot of hope, it shows how brilliant this new generation is, and, and all we had to do was give her, was give her the, the right tools and put the right team for her to tell the story. Um, the, the documentary won Sundance, it won South by Southwest, 
National Geographic bought it. You can see it today on the Disney Channel. And, and that same experience we had with Who Killed Malcolm X, with a trafficker series, with drug wars. And, and those are different ways of telling our stories uh, with time, with the right um, dedication, resources um, that, that we all hope to have. And, and I have also found that there, there's a lot of storytelling today um, that is based on real journalism, on real um, investigation that has fiction because the narrative arc sometimes demands it because sometimes you cannot um, name the, the, the people the way that you would like to, but that it allows you to tell a compelling story that looks very real. Um, and and I, I started to, to pay a lot of attention when my favorite you know, scripted series was The Wire. And I saw the work that they did in taking Baltimore as an example of uh, the different crises going on in the country with corruption, education, media, and, and extrapolate that and tell the story in a way that was more relatable to people. I don't have more um, uh, slides to share, so I will be very happy to answer all of your questions. And uh, Jessica, please uh, tell us if there's something that we need to do differently. No, well, Isaac, thank you. That was um, wonderful to, um, to bring people inside. And I didn't know that bit about your background and Mike Wallace. So now I, you know, it's a great <laughs> anecdote in the, the storytelling frame, but um, you took us through some, I think very important changes and in a lot of topics as well. Um, I, as I'm sort of collating some of the questions and I can fire them to you. Please. Um, can, can you start by talking about someone who's, who's passionate about um, you know, storytelling and breaking news in, in this format. What advice do you have in terms of how to get started in their careers right now? It's, uh, it's just don't be disappointed by what you're reading every day and how local journalism is dying. Um, things are changing. Things are evolving. You see experiments like The Athletic doing... Uh, local journalism in a different way. Uh, they're being very successful and they're doing a fantastic job. Um, you see that people are writing in these different um, platforms like Substack and like Patreon. You can start your own podcast. You can start to have a, um, a blog. And if you're doing a really good job, if you are thorough, you will see that people will start to follow and will start to pay attention. If, if you ask me who are the most relevant uh, people in the industry today talking about OTT or this or that, they're not necessarily the media editors. They are the people that are incredibly well-informed. If you follow Matthew Ball, if you follow Richard Greenfield, if you... You, you will understand that um, um, information is about expertise, is about dedication, is about thought process. And, you know, master a skill and become really good at something. Um, I, I always think that whoever is willing to take you as an intern and give you the opportunity to do the job, to prove yourself, um, that's the way to start. So take it, go, kill it. And uh, if, if you're really passionate and you really care, it won't stop you. And Isaac, and how much does the platform matter in getting that start? I mean, you mentioned you can convey that expertise across newsletters and you talked about Snap and TikTok. Do you see those as springboards to... Um, or ways to build, or maybe obviously they can be careers in and of themselves. But um, you know, the the bar to 
distribution is still low, but a little higher when you consider production value. So absolutely, um, I I think Jessica that that more uh, time reporting and depth is key, and those platforms are not necessarily the best place for that, though they are amplifiers. They allow you to share your story, your point of view, your uniqueness, and point them into the right direction. Um, I, I think that if you have a, a big following on any of those platforms and you tell them that you just wrote a story or have a new podcast and you uh, share it, people will be able to uh, find it easier, uh, become fans. But, but the, the, although the threshold is not very high, um, to tell your stories in a tweet or to tell your stories in a snap, it's harder. And, and it's harder to get credibility when you're starting. So my, my advice is do the hard work, uh, uh, do the reporting, take the time, and then find the best path to amplify it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um we have a, a question that's been um, echoed a lot around fighting misinformation and how do you fight misinformation when big news outlets and even prominent public figures repeat it? And, um, you know, just, just diving in for the big questions here sure. and uh, getting even um, deeper. Can, is it possible to be objective when giving other, the other side time and space for their points of view? Yeah. If so, such an easy question, Jessica. <laughs> so I, I, I don't believe in fake objectivity. Uh, I don't think that the he said, she said way of telling stories is the right path to take. I, I believe that you have to try to be as honest and as independent in your reporting as possible. And you should always strive for the truth being rigorous um, and, and try to be in the pursuit of that goal. But know that we all carry our background, our experiences, our ideology, and you just have to be honest and upfront about it. People don't mind when you see things in a way that you are absolutely transparent that, that 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 is what you think what you have lived what you have experienced um what what we have to avoid is to get into the partisan dynamic um that that has uh ruined the way that we do journalism today uh, we cannot only cultivate relationships on one side or the other we cannot believe that getting scoops is more important than holding people accountable. And to be honest, I mean, I, I don't think that what, you know, big, uh, profitable, successful companies like Fox, I don't believe that what they do is news. I think that what they do is awful. I think it poisons people's brains. Um, they are an undeniable, powerful force. Uh, they have astronomical profit margins. I can understand why it makes sense for their business, for their business. But the way that they sway the conversation and the way that they influence um, uh, democracy is is you know very very concerning. On the other hand, I I think that one of the best um, uh, examples of journalism today. Uh, and, and maybe it's because of the situation that we're living, is what we see sometimes in comedy. I think that the investigative team that John Oliver has is fantastic. They, they have um, uh, people dissecting issues and telling you in an explanatory way um, uh, complex stories that, that you can understand. And they always kind of come with a point of view and they don't try to hide it. Um, but, you know, when I was at Univision, Jessica, I, I was always asked if we were confusing activism with journalism. It was a question that was always um, uh, prevalent. And, and I, I, 
I was never apologetic at being pro-Hispanic. I, I never minded to be um, leading a newsroom for an, a population that didn't have enough representation, that was lost in translation. And I think that sometimes journalists have to choose in which side of history they want to be. Uh, when you were in the Second World War um, and your country was fighting with allies against the Nazis, it was okay for wanting the allies to win the war. I think it was normal. I think it's what you expect for any human being that had sense at that time. That doesn't mean that you wouldn't investigate any abuse of power, any wrongdoing, any uh, corruption, any of the faults that um, your country was being part of. You need to hold them to a higher level of accountability because you believe in them. Um, but to pretend to be objective and to try to please everyone is always a bad idea. Yeah. When um, you talked about the rise of the sort of documentary as a place for investigative journalism, there's a question here, I think is an excellent one about how, how does that change the process or, you know, does, um, I think that's the question. Um, I think it was better put than that. So would you consider long form journalism in the style of doc documentary an extension of newsroom journalism, or is it a different field to enter separately? I think it's, it's a complementary field. I think that um, it has to do with uh, thinking fast and slow. You, you need to break news. You need to um, inform people uh, of what's going on today. Uh, you need to give uh, as much context as possible, but sometimes it's important to take some steps back and to analyze things with a different perspective, to look at them with a cool head, with more time, with more um, amplitude. And that is what documentaries allow you to do, to look at a period of time in a different way. Um, I can give you a couple of great examples for, for uh, people to watch that I strongly recommend. There's a great um, documentary called The Edge of Democracy at Netflix that talks about all the political process and corruption in Brazil. I think it's fantastic. Uh, Asif Kapadia's documentary about Maradona for the sports fans is, is really, really good. Um, and and so the, there are many ways to look at things with enough time to give you perspective and to have a different conversation that it's not necessarily defensive. I, I remember the interview that they uh, did in the documentary, The Fog of War, to Robert McNamara. I thought it was phenomenal. And that that is a conversation that it would have been impossible to have you know, a couple of decades before. Um, sometimes you need to uh, revisit things to be able to understand them better and give the, some historical context to what we're living today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great suggestions. I need some more, so that's great. Keep them coming. Um, there was a great question about how to resist, if you find in pitching a story and your editor wants to make it you know, more entertaining and maybe sacrifice some of that context. Um, how, how as a reporter do you kind of push back? This is a great question for really. It's a, it's a fantastic question. Well, first, understand your editor. Understand that the editors are going to be judged by results and their bosses are going to be judged by profitability. And you need to be a team player and you need to do a good job as a journalist. But the way to persuade them is not to make it lighter or more, uh, you know, uh, or more irrelevant. The way to persuade them is to know more, to have the data, to be able to make them understand that the picture they have is not the right picture, that there is more to that story 
and that you know how to tell the story in a different way. And be pushy, you know, don't take no for an answer. Newsrooms are getting uh, a voice today that they have never had before. Use it um, and, and convince them. Uh, now, work hard. Don't, don't try to uh, ask for just more time or more space because you don't want to edit or because you're lazy. Do it because you, you think that what you have to say um, is inevitable and it's your job to do it. Great answer. Um, let's see here. Wanna, there was one that was liked a bunch. Um, feel free to keep submitting your questions if I miss them, they're scrolling fast. Um, COVID related, you, you talked about how um, viewers' interests and tastes are sort of shifting, which I think is fascinating and, and probably good for our industry in some ways. Um, how how does how are you seeing more some of the nuts and bolts of production shifting in terms of remote and and um, what just uh, what are you seeing in that regard? Is 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 it possible to to do great work right now in in the medium? It is so possible that it's scary. Okay. So my my advice is prepare yourself because we had structures that we didn't need. We were doing things that were not a must. Uh, we had budgets that were not being used in the most appropriate ways. Um, and we are learning that the technology to be nimbler, to move faster and to do the job is there. And if I am leading any media company today, I will be rethinking what's the best path and the best way to do things. Um, so, so I think that all the elements are there. Um, there are very brave journalists that are taking risks, that are um, covering the stories um, in, a, in a very difficult environment, but nobody has stopped doing their job because we are living in a pandemic. Um, and, and what I can tell you is that I, I am not sure that many of the things that we were doing and many of the structures and millions of dollars that we were using to do things were absolutely necessary. I, I, I think we should all revisit those, those ways. Yep. Um, that's inspiring, particularly for new entrants in the industry. So. Yes. There's a question here, which is something on my mind too. Do you worry as the sort of documentary genre becomes very attractive to Netflix and all those the streaming providers? How do you um, how do we resist the slippage again into making it entertainment and to just sort of um, you know distortion for the sake of entertainment? It, it does seem like um, you know those platforms. You know, every platform has its own metrics that it's driving, but you know, Netflix' goal isn't to win a Pulitzer Prize or you know an Emmy for. But yeah. maybe, maybe it is, but and, and not it that should it, be. it should yeah. be. I I I think that you are seeing positive signs, and also you are seeing a representation of society. Um, mm -hmm. When Tiger King is the most viewed uh, program on Netflix. I don't think we can blame it on Netflix. Uh, I think we need to blame it on us uh, mm -hmm. uh, because it's ridiculous. But I also think that when they make a movie like Roma with a director like Cuaron and mm -hmm. they spend that amount of money and time and resources to tell such a different niche story uh, and they end up winning an Oscar is a very good sign. Mm -hmm. So let's let's all incentivize them by watching the things that matter and paying less attention to the things that really don't matter or are ridiculous or are not a representation of who you are in society. Mm -hmm. Isaac, where do you think, I mean, this answer to this is probably infinite, but in terms of places where you see untold stories or you know, stories that are, are getting, you know, not their deserved share of the attention right now. Um, what are some of those areas? And yes, where 
<laughs> I, I love that question. Look, I, I always think that Latin America is um, overlooked. Um, it's too important for the United States. Um, it, it has tremendous effects on everything, the economy, uh, immigration, trade, democracy, it's pandemics. You, you cannot live in this world today thinking that there is no effect on what happens in any other place. So if Bolsonaro is an irresponsible president and he's burning the Amazon and letting COVID um, uh, um, grow to absurd uh, numbers, that is your problem. <laughs> it's not the problem for Brazilians only. Um, we, we all live in the same world. So um, aside from that, I think that there's a huge opportunity, Jessica, in, in um, women creators. Um, if you look at the lack of representation in uh, TV and film today, the intersection of Latinas and LGBTQ and diverse communities um, is, is appalling. And I, I think that uh, part of the problem of studios, newspapers, networks, is that the demographics have changed, the country has changed, and the newsrooms haven't. Um, and that is a huge problem. If we still think that a newsroom of white dudes can produce the right content for the country we live in, we are wrong. And um, I, 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 it's re I, I still can believe that we are debating why there aren't enough women in leadership positions. It's, it's crazy. Uh, and, and, and so if we are still having that conversation, imagine what it is if you are a trans African American or if you are a gay Latino or if you are the, the opportunities to tell those stories are, are huge and are there. And, and there's always um, a fixation in what we already know. Um, I think that reggaeton is a completely um, uh, uh, under-represented uh, story. I think that uh, when you have um, uh, Bad Bunny and Daddy Yankee and J Balvin and those guys being the most streamed artists globally on Spotify, there is a phenomenon there. And when you look at where is that coming from and you see that it's being born in Puerto Rico and being born in the favelas in Medellin, um, there's a lot of social anthropological interest that we should look into. Um, uh, so I, I find that fascinating. Um, and and I, I also think that we don't ask enough questions about what's going on with the economy. Uh, mm -hmm. We just approved a, a bailout uh, that had no discussion, uh, where both parties moved in an incredibly fast way um, I don't think any journalist can answer precisely where the money is going and if that is the right way to reactivate the economy. And, you know, when interests are, um, are so clear, I think we have to ask more. Um, and, and, and that is key. I also like the fact that um, there's more and more specialization in journalism that we understand that just being a good storyteller is not enough to understand a virus or a pandemic. That if you want to talk about privacy and you want to talk about rabbit holes and uh, tech, Kevin Roos and Kashmir Hill and those guys are, are specialists in their field. That if you want to understand what goes on in Silicon Valley and venture capital, 
the information is growing and becoming what it is because it has the best reporters. And, and I, that's, that's strongly how I feel. Um, if you are really into gaming and, you know, Kotaku is fantastic. If you like analysis at sports and the intersections between sports and society, I think that that spin is incredibly relevant. Uh, so, so I, I like the fact that journalists really need to make a bigger effort and become more knowledgeable to, to be, to deserve the role of telling the story to the audience. It's a nice way to put it for sure. Um, speaking of specialization, there was a good question about the role you see, um, big data and techno like technology playing in um, video and television? Look, I, I, I think that we cannot um, dismiss data, but I also think that if someone would have had a meeting um, with, um, um, I just forgot, the creator of Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Lin-Manuel Miranda. Manuel, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, if you have had a meeting with Lin-Manuel Miranda five years ago, and he will tell you that he has this amazing story to create a Broadway show, that it's going to be a musical about Hamilton, um, no big data will be able to support that. And no one would be able to tell you that that was going to be such a huge success. And... Um, big data only takes you so far. It allows you to understand the past. It allows you to predict things if behavior doesn't change, but it doesn't tell you how things are going to evolve and how uh, dramatic tectonic shifts like a pandemic, the, like the one we're having, are going to change the way we consume and we like to be informed and what matters to us. So yes, pay attention to data, but don't follow data like a religion. Yeah, I like that very much. It tells us what happened in the past, but um, you know, it's our job to look ahead too, so. Absolutely, um, and, and you know, AI will never be able to replace original way of thinking. It will never be able to tell the story that comes out of sadness, um, uh, adversity, complexity, um, achievement. That Those are human emotions that move us. And uh, they are not replaceable. And I think that is a very positive thing. Yep. Well, that's nice to put. Um what advice do you have for freelancers in, in this environment? Is the question in there. Look, I, I, I think that um, everyone who wants to be can be an accomplished freelancer. Um, it's, it's very hard for a respectable media company to deny an expert the opportunity to share good information. And mm -hmm. that's how you let yourself be known uh, that's how you get an audience. Uh, and in this environment and in this economy, when you can work from wherever you are um, and all the tools are there, uh, being a freelancer is a pretty good job. I mean, you, you can be a freelancer uh, and end up creating your own company. Joe Rogan, which is not my best example of journalism, but it's a great example of someone who started doing a podcast, created an empire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's I, that line, you know, any res most respectable news organizations won't deny an audience a good story. That's a good one. I, I think I, last week I said to people, you know, if you come to me with like a great story, you know, I will find a way to publish it. And exactly. Will not, um, that is not a, problem. That's a good challenge to have as an editor. Um, and, and also, I think that if you really want to do a good job to meet the filters of an editor, of a fact checker, of a copy editor, 
and have the, the backup of a news organization, it's the difference between uh, uh, media and credibility and just posting things somewhere. Yep, um, absolutely. Um, a, a nice question here, we're, we're gonna wrap up. So fire away with any, any last few here. Um, the question is just, um, how you, how in specifically um, for Latin Americans, but I, I think it's more broadly, uh, can we create more alliances with American media to to help them get more amplification around the diverse stories? Um, so I think the question is is specifically about um, better positioning Latin America media across the globe, but also I think you know we could extend it to forging alliances for other underrepresented groups. Just be interested in what goes on around the world. Um, the president of Mexico just met with President Trump. Um, uh, if you didn't know that, then uh, something's wrong with the way that you are consuming media. Um, but but I, I think that there is amazing people uh, doing a great job telling stories like Asam Ahmed from the New York Times in Mexico, or David Luno and Jose de Cordoba from the Wall Street Journal. And um, they, they are telling uh, compelling stories that will allow us to understand what we live today in a much better way. We live in a completely interconnected society. Most of the immigrants that are here have their families back home. Uh, they send billions of dollars in remittances. Um, you, you, you cannot separate uh, family connections and friends and culture and ideology uh, just because there is a border. So um, uh, be open because the information is there and, and there's very good work being done. I, I, it's something I liked very much. Uh, ben uh, Smith wrote a column um, recently about independent news organizations that are being challenged by uh, their countries or their governments. And, and look at what's happening with uh, Maria Ressa and Rappler in the Philippines. That is a fantastic example of the world we don't want to live in. On, on how much it matters to have a brave journalist that has clear what her responsibility is and, and how risky it is not to put a stop to uh, plutocrats and autocrats and, and how much damage they can do. Let's learn from the countries that are already in the path of where we never want to be before we get there. Um, well, that is a great uh, note to end on. Although I, I think we were we were optimistic enough, Isaac. That was your goal. Yes, yes. Um, and I have, hope uh, we have the best profession in the world. It's impossible to be bored if you're a journalist. It's impossible not to use all the opportunities and the disruption that we have if you're a journalist. Um, let Let's uh, be very enthusiastic, work very hard, prepare yourself really well, um, and, and uh, go out and tell the stories because your contribution to society, democracy, uh, health, the environment, all of those things um, are, are as impactful as possible um, if you are a good journalist. Yeah, wonderful. Um, well, Isaac, thank you for your time. Um, to everyone in the class, the um, we'll keep the or the networking will open up after this. So if you have time to stick around and want to um, randomly meet someone else in the group, um, just click the little handshake um, networking uh, icon, and please um, you know use the Facebook group to share what you liked about our session. If there were topics we missed, we have a little room um, in the curriculum to, to add some of the stuff that we know we're gonna, we've missed. So um, please give us that feedback. Isaac, thank you very much. You, you've left it, it just every conversation. I'm more inspired and 
um, I know everyone else here is as well. So thank you again. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you for doing this. This is great. Um, it's a very good example of the things we can do and we don't do because it takes time and it takes effort. But now that you decided to do it and you put it together, why, I think that you have many allies that are here to help. Well, we're very grateful. Have a wonderful evening or morning or wherever you find yourself today, everyone. Um, and we'll see you on Thursday to talk with um, Peter Kafka and Lydia Polgreen about podcasting. So um, that's stay great. Bye-bye. <laughs>